Hello everyone, welcome to another video. Haven't posted in a while, but I'm gonna try to get back into the groove again. Uh, I've been kind of busy, but uh, yeah, let's get into the video. So the first year of pure maths and theoretical physics was filled with the hardest academic experiences uh, in my life. And this video, I'll rank the top four things. I can really come up with five. Ranking severity and what I learned from them. Starting out with the least difficult thing at number four is time management. University does go really quick. So when starting university, I thought that I would be very, very well prepared since I did study 300% at high school my last year, uh, which I've probably said that many times, but university was, was definitely a shock because the pace was, or at least felt a lot quicker. And I think this was mainly due to the difficulty Definitely there was a giant leap in difficulty, I would say, from high school mathematics, where I took the hardest math courses there was, uh, to like the introductory level uh, math courses uh, in uni. I remember the first uh, day of uni, uh, where there was an introductory meeting, and I was kind of cocky. I thought I could study extra, like at 150%. So at the introductory meeting, there were like questions, and I was the only one raising my hand. And I wondered if it uh, if it was something that was recommended by the teacher staff, and uh, the 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 professor or whoever that was said that it isn't really recommended and you should probably not study that much. But I was like, nah, I'll do it. My I, I can do it. So in the first semester, I had an extra analysis course uh, in one variable analysis, and oh boy, that that was one of the hardest uh, courses I've taken. This was mainly due to the just shock uh, when it came to reading mathematics and stuff. And we'll get into that later, uh, which is number or something. But just after a couple weeks, I felt super overwhelmed and I ditched the analysis course. I thought I wouldn't take it since it was, it was too difficult. But after meeting someone else who was actually studying at 200%, I felt that I could actually do it since, I mean, I had an example of someone who, who did study even more than I did. So I thought, yeah, I can try again and eventually it got easier. So what I noticed was that courses usually are very quick in the beginning, trying to cover as much material as possible, a couple chapters uh, a day, and then in the end, they leave like a month or something, or, or at least one week, not maybe a month, to revise. And this, this was very good for me. So eventually I could finish the analysis course and I actually got an A or a pass with distinction, which is the highest grade in, in my university. So what I learned is that it's definitely possible studying extra, but it's, it's a really good idea to understand the course structure and and stuff like that, and not to burn yourself out, which was something I kind of did <laughs> just a week into to university. It's also worth mentioning that high school, the system is built so you have designated time to do like, to socialize, to do homework, but in uni, everything is up to you. And that was kind of a shock to me as like a teenager coming into university, uh, but eventually it worked out pretty well, and you'll find your own groove if you're now in, in if in your, if you're watching this at, in high school, so it's not really a big deal, but uh, definitely the first couple weeks or months uh, are kind of kind of shaky in my end at least. But in the end, I think that it's a lot better. It's a better system, and uh, you have more freedom and stuff, and that's nice because usually when you start university, you're a teenager or uh, close to being an adult, and it's a it's a good way of growing up and becoming becoming mature and stuff. So yeah, that's why it's at number four. At number three is reading mathematics, which is a lot more difficult and different from normal textbooks and high school mathematics textbooks. The textbook that really gave me a run for my money was the linear algebra textbook, which is innocent looking, you know, just uh, 130 pages, I think. But uh, when you open the book, there's like no text, only definitions, examples, lemmas, theorems. I guess the only explainer text is the, uh, is in the examples. But chapters usually just start with definition and you have to try to make sense of it on your own. And a big tip is actually reading through the proof and doing it yourself on a blank piece of paper so you don't have any help. And a good thing is also to slow down. I mean, yes, it's 130 pages, but it's just pure math. So you have to go through it very slowly 
compared to like a novel or something where you read like maybe 30 pages an hour or something. Here you maybe do a couple pages uh, per hour uh, at most, you know. If you under some proofs can be a whole page and you have to understand each logical step and maybe in the exam you have to prove it yourself. So it's a good good thing to just slow down and uh, and write rewrite the proof on a piece of paper. And this way you yourself can build up all the mathematics and this definitely brings a lot of understanding uh, to your brain and knowledge. It's also really important to know your definitions, especially when you're doing proofs. If you don't know your definitions, it's very hard to reason mathematically and to come up with the proofs yourself. And very frequently you're stuck just memorizing the proofs instead of actually following the reasoning and why you're doing each step and what, what it does to the proof. And with this you can implement those proof techniques to other theorems, uh, which is very useful for your continued studies. Coming up at number two is confidence in what counts as understanding. And what I mean by this is many cases you think you understand something, but you actually don't. Or you think you have intuition for something which actually isn't supposed to be there. For example, in physics, you can mostly get away with intuition and have waving through some concepts. That is, if you're doing basic physics, as I understand it, more advanced physics is more mathematical based, so this also applies there. But in mathematics, even if you understand something on the surface level, and or if you have intuition for something like integration or something you can still be wrong very wrong in fact the feeling of i kind of get it is sometimes a trap and i had to train myself to always say can i prove it or can i explain to someone else or do i even know my definitions most likely if i'm feeling that i kind of understand something i don't really have these foundations in place and sometimes during exams or whatever or during some problems, you can get really wrong answers. A perfect example of the un unintuitiveness of mathematics is the Cantor set, which has measure zero, but has as many points in it as the interval from zero to one. Very big in, term in terms of points, but very small when it comes to length, which is, which is a very weird phenomenon. Other examples are also the space filling curve, where a curve is able to fill a space, which is also very unintuitive. How can line become area? All of these things were covered in my second semester and basically destroyed all my intuition, or at least challenged it a bit. As my analysis professor said, beginner analysis courses start with training your intuition, then the more you advance, it proves why your intuition is wrong. At number one is proofs which maybe isn't a big surprise. So in my first day of university mathematics, my instructor said to prove that one times X is equal to X, where X is a variable or a real variable. And my brain instantly thought, well, isn't that obvious? Or do we really have to prove it? But that's like a wrong way of seeing it. The main point of it was to understand your definitions and what you assume and what you need to prove. In that case, we didn't assume that 1 times x is equal to x, but we assumed some basic axioms, and from these axioms, we needed to prove their very simple, or seemingly simple, theorems, which 1 times x is equal to x now is. Which is very different from high school, where you don't really do that. You don't have axioms, or you don't, you don't make a big deal of it, out of it. So let's prove the theorem that one times x is equal to x. So what we're doing here is a chain of equalities. Firstly, we have zero times x, which is equal to zero plus zero times x. So by the axiom, zero minus zero is equal to zero. Then we distribute the x to the zero and negative zero, which is also part of our axiom system. With this, we get zero times x minus zero times x. Since negative zero times x is the additive inverse of zero times x, it's equal to zero. Thus we've proven the statement or the theorem. So some tips are knowing your definitions when it comes to proofs. If you don't know them, you're not gonna understand the proof. 
if the proof uses some of the definitions, which all of them do, they have some basis on definitions. Also, good thing is to name the definition the proof is trying, is using. Is it direct, contradiction, contrapositive, or if, is it an induction proof? If so, what is the induction on? What variable is the dimension? Is it the index? What is it? If a statement is on the form, if P then Q, maybe the proof tactic is contrapositive, which is if not Q, then not P. And nine times out of 10, it isn't explicitly said in the proof. So you have to yourself try to feel out what is used. Also know what the goal is, because most of the time as well, the writer doesn't write when the proof is done. It just ends. And then you have to know, ah, oh, okay, this is the, this was the goal and we're actually done here. Okay, I get it. That That's what you need to do. So yeah, proof was the most challenging parts. Thanks everyone for watching. I have like 2% on my phone, so I'm going to end it here. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.